So what's the risk? Is this genetic? Well, that could be the subject of a whole lecture. What does it mean that something is genetically based? When we talk about heritability, behavioral genetics, twin studies, adoption studies, why am I so scattered and most of you so focused? Why am I only average in height? Some people are tall, better genes. I might have been a better basketball player. What, how do we explain the differences across people? Are they largely due to genes, largely due to environments, or something in between? That's heritability. It doesn't tell you which genes. It gives you a proportion of the variation. So what's the heritability of major depression? 29% in men, 39% in women, Sullivan et al. 2002. Environments have more to do, on average, with depression risk than genes. What's the heritability of schizophrenia? 60, 65 percent, depending on your estimates. Heritability of bipolar disorder, 80 to 85 percent. What's the heritability of inattentive symptoms or response disinhibitory impulsive symptoms? 75 to 80 percent. There's a big genetic proclivity to being at that far end of the tail. So of course that means that it's inevitable. It's in your genes, there's nothing you can do about it. I hope you were awake for Pat's talk. That's simply not the case. And even at a population genetic level, our colleague Eric Turkheimer published an important paper 12 years ago looking at IQ scores around the United States fairly heritable overall, around 60%, whether IQ measures intelligence is another question, but whatever IQ scores are measuring. But then he looked for the moderator variable of social class and divided into quintiles, the way Moffat did with her quintiles that, that Pat just showed you. For the highest social class in the United States, what was the estimated heritability of IQ? 0.7 to 0.8. Most of the variation seems to be determined by genes. For the lowest quintile, the most impoverished kids in the United States, what was the heritability estimate for IQ? 20 to 25 percent. What? I thought this was heritability. I thought it was genes. They're immutable. It's the same. No. Heritability is the proportion of variance accounted for by genes versus environments. If you're in a high-risk environment, in the lowest social class, there's myriad ways in which the environment can literally switch on or switch off genes and impede cognitive development, much more so than in the highest social class. I mean, you could say, I guess, how many ways can you have a TV in every room and, and how many ways can you get driven to your favorite preschool that's private? Not that many ways, but there's a lot of ways that the environment can impinge at the high risk end of the spectrum. Even if inattention and impulse control problems are under some genetic control, this does not mean that these influences are immutable for all the reasons you heard earlier this morning and yesterday and for other reasons we'll talk about in a few minutes. What are other risk factors for pretty serious inattention and pretty serious impulse, impulse control problems? Being born at a low birth weight. And if you go from low to very low to extremely low, the risk multiplies almost exponentially. Why is this an issue? Because these kids survive now, and they didn't 30 years ago. Low birth weight predicts a spectrum of problems that have to do with learning and motor, Tourette's, cerebral palsy, learning disabilities, ADHD symptoms, not anxiety, depression, or conduct disorders. We could talk more about that if there were only time. What about prenatal substance use. Prenatal alcohol use, of course, if it's extreme or if it's binging, predicts fetal alcohol syndrome, mental retardation, facial dysmorphisms. But what about fetal alcohol effects, or what's sometimes called fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? What are the symptoms of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? Inattention, impulsivity, hyperactivity, and learning problems. So an unknown percentage of kids, perhaps at some genetic risk, also are exposed to alcohol in utero, and it's pouring gasoline on a fire. Early smoking, implicated in several major epidemiologic studies, prenatal smoking with ADHD, but in the interesting work of Anita Thapper and colleagues in England through reproductive assistance technology, surrogates, 
it seems that it's more of a genetic link than smoking done in the surrogate household. Not saying smoking's good for the developing embryo and fetus for many other reasons, but it may not be the cause of ADHD symptoms. What about early attachment? The literature is getting interesting, but the bottom line is that if you separate out inattention and response inhibition from aggressive and antisocial behavior, early insecure attachment rampantly predicts later antisocial behavior, but has very low prediction to these core facets of inattention and impulse control problems. So if you're building a very preliminary model, these problems are neurocognitive, they may have some emotional roots too, but it's the insecurity of early attachment that may predict which of those vulnerable kids really goes on to an antisocial trajectory. And there's exceptions to what I'm saying. In the Minneapolis sample of Carlson, Betty Carlson and Alan Srove, early maternal insensitivity, not attachment status per se, predicted ADHD-like behaviors over the next few years but it was not a genetically informative sample, so we're not sure what was genetic and what was psychosocial transmission. And what's another way to produce severely inattentive and severely overactive symptomatology? Place a kid in a horrific Eastern European orphan, orphanage, and along with very difficult attachment behaviors and uh, relationship problems and indiscriminate friendliness, inattention and overactivity are the two biggest behavioral sequelae. So what is this? Exemplify, equifinality, many roads lead to Rome. Different developmental risk factors and various combinations may produce what looks like the same syndrome at a given point in time. Quick tribute to our colleague Sue Campbell at Pittsburgh, who's retiring this year, developmental and clinical temperamental dimensions underlying. Well, duh, the most severe kids persisted. But predictor number two even if you take that out of the equation, the severity of the inattentive and impulse, impulsive behaviors in those kids, the negative quality of the parent-child interaction as videotaped in the playroom was a huge predictor of the persistence of ADHD. Arguably, the parents didn't cause those behaviors, quote unquote, except maybe through the genes and the temperamental dysregulation they transmitted, but how the parents responded early on made a huge difference for outcome, both in persistence and in comorbidity. Now, we did a study a little bit later in development. The only problem with the study was that we didn't do the crucial manipulation of the independent variable. We didn't randomly assign kids with high levels of impulsivity to live in various households for 10 years. Berkeley's Institutional Review Board had slight problems with that. So we did the next best thing, which is a longitudinal correlational study. What are the factors that predict, and we publish this in child development, not always a friend of child psychopathology research, what are the factors that we measured, kids coming to our summer programs for social competence? Who was well liked? Who received a lot of positive peer nominations? So we measure behavior every day, we've got background family information, and we happen to put in the equation arguably the worst method for measuring quality of parent-child interaction, which is to ask the parents how good of parents they were. On my parenting scales, I have always been calm with my three boys, have always delivered a reward, have never raised my voice. You can look it up on my scale. So, the ideas about parenting scale a lot of tribute to Diana Baumrin, still uh, alive and well at Berkeley, working down an Institute of Human Development, helped contribute. This is a scale where it's not so clear always what the right answers to the questions are. So a very clean factor emerged from this scale, ideas about parenting, called authoritative, and of course back to developmental psychology days, authoritative parenting is marked by high warmth and responsiveness and high limit setting and control. It's in that quadrant. Also, strong autonomy demands, and reasoning with your kid about the rules you have in the house, not right after the kid has pulled the cat's tail, that would be rewarding the behavior, but during neutral times. So some of the items on this scale are here, and we had primary caregivers, caregivers spill out this scale. The mothers of boys with very severe inhibitory problems, AD diagnoses scored a lot lower on this authoritative factor 
responsiveness and high limit setting and control. It's in that quadrant. Also, strong autonomy demands and reasoning with your kid about the rules you have in the house, not right after the kid has pulled the cat's tail, that would be rewarding the behavior, but during neutral times. So some of the items on this scale are here, and we had primary caregivers, caregivers fill out this scale. The mothers of boys with very severe inhibitory problems, ADHD diagnoses, scored a lot lower on this authoritative factor than the mothers of our normative comparison group. Would write in the margins things like, warm, we haven't had a pleasant dinner time in the last five years. Pushing for independence, if he graduates from high school, it'll be a miracle. A lot of work to, to deal with these kids who are giving you problems every day. But the variance was just as high in the group of primary caregivers of the ADHD group as in the comparison group. When you've got high variance, maybe you're going to find high covariance. When we put everything in the equation, there was one significant predictor of the boy's number of positive nominations received at the camp, which was the primary caregivers, mainly mothers, that's why it says mom on the graph, scores on authoritative responsive parenting. And this relationship, statistically, applied only for the ADHD group. If you were in the comparison group of boys at the same summer camp, there's a lot of reasons why you might develop friends, and the quality of your parenting at home had very little, if nothing, at all to do with it. But if you're behind the eight ball, super parenting may push you into social competence. Now, if only we'd had brain imaging during the summer camp, and if we could have obviously follow those boys from the time they were one and two, not just seven, eight, and nine. It's a correlational study, it's not a true experimental trial, but it suggests that roots of social competence are based in socialization.